Oh, hi there. My name is Mel, and I've been reading for as long as I can remember. I love it so much, in fact, that it is now actually my job. However, as of late, I've been making all types of excuses as to why I don't have time to read. I'm editing, running errands, I'm cooking, hanging out with friends and family. So I thought, what better way to make sure I'm reading every day than waking up at 5 a.m. every morning for a week to give myself more time and zero excuses. And this, friends, is what happened. Good morning, friends. Cup of tea has been made. I cannot start out my mornings without a good cup of tea. I think it's also very fitting because it's a Kingdom of the Wicked mug and I am thinking of starting a Kingdom of the Wicked related book. It's 5.21 a.m. I do have to admit, I am a morning person. I don't find it very difficult to wake up at this time of day. There used to be a time around two years ago that I used to wake up at 5 a.m. every single morning. I love taking advantage of the day. I love feeling like my day has been long and plentiful and that I got to do everything I needed to. I don't like to wake up late and feel like half the day has gone by just with the sleeping. So I already love this. I love waking up early and making time for the things that I know I love. And I am always the type of person that I'm waking up these days and I'm looking at my phone. I'm looking at my email bright and early in the morning. I am looking at text. I'm going on social media super early and I do feel the effects of it, whether it's the stress or the anxiety or some external factor contributing to my morning not being the greatest. And so waking up at 5 a.m. this week really is not only a desperate attempt to reset my sleeping clock, but to also make sure that I'm starting out my mornings, not looking at my phone, not going on socials, not checking emails, and that I'm actually carving out time to do the thing that I know sets me up for success for the day. And that is reading. I don't know what I'm starting out with this morning. We're starting out something new. So I've got three options right here at my bedside table. I picked these out last night. I brought these over to the bedroom so that I didn't have to do too much figuring out this morning. I figured all of these could be great options. So we've got Romancing Mr. Bridgerton. This isn't on my CBR, by the way, so we'd be off to a great start. <laughs> if I chose this one. And then these other two options are on my TBR. So I have got Magnolia Parks, The Long Way Home. And then for the Kingdom of the Wicked related thing that I told you about, we have got Throne of the Fallen, which is the follow-up series to Kingdom of the Wicked. When in doubt, random number generated out. It's too early for me to make choices myself. So I'll let a random number generator do it. So let's do a number between one and two. Let us have Magnolia Parks be number one and Throne of the Fallen be number two. Now random number generator, please guide me to the book that I am going to absolutely love. Is it one, Magnolia Parks, or is it two, Run of the Fallen? Let's find out. So it is, oh, Magnolia Parks. Okay, that was surprising. I didn't think Magnolia was going to win. So let us do Magnolia Parks. This is exciting. <laughs> crooked right now, but it's 8.49 a.m. It's been a couple of hours. I did read for three hours, I think, and the past 40 something minutes have been invested into showering, getting dressed. So obviously I started Magnolia Parks The Long Way Home and I got to page 131. So I'm about to start chapter 22. And listen, I already kind of knew that the problem with Daisy Hates was Daisy Hates. From the tone of the book to the setup and the footnotes, all the way to the characters themselves, I really wasn't vibing with Daisy Hates. Do I know in my heart of hearts that Daisy Hates is a necessary read in the series? Yes, I do. Is skipping it the right choice for me though? Yes, it is. As soon as I entered Magnolia, I was reminded of how much I loved book one and how different this feels to Daisy Hates. I am so excited and so happy to be back with my A-lister toxic couple. So in this one, we follow Magnolia and BJ, childhood best friends turned lovers. The way that the book sets them up very much makes them seem like star-crossed lovers in ways. They definitely seem to be made for each other, but circumstances continuously keep them apart from each other, those circumstances being themselves. And so book one sets them up after coming out of their relationship due to BJ cheating on Magnolia. And obviously that's a huge hurdle in any relationship and it definitely is one for them. However, for them, instead of growing apart after this hiccup, we'll call it that, 
they grow even closer together. They have these mechanisms in place just to make sure that the other cares. They know how to make each other tick, how to make each other jealous, how to make each other be there always, regardless of the circumstances. And it really is the case of when they are with each other, the rest of the world disappears. It is not only blatant to them, but it is blatant to everybody around them. Everybody kind of knows that when Magnolia and BJ are around each other, there is nothing else happening. There is only them. It's like they suck the energy out of a room and it's electric. And so they're toxic as shit to start things off, starting this book with the plot twist and the reveal that we, that we read about in book one. I was already very intrigued to see where we were going to be set and how things were going to evolve. This book takes place exactly a year after the ending of Magnolia Parks one. I was not expecting that long a time jump between book one and book two. And we start out with Magnolia being in New York and her having to come back to London for a huge event for her family. And she reconnects with BJ after a year of not talking, obviously thinking about him continuously. And things kind of go downhill from there. There was a backstory and a twist that I was not expecting at all. So right from the go, I am so invested. Something that happened when Magnolia was 16 that really changed the course and altered her relationship with BJ, both in good and bad ways. And they've been keeping a huge secret amongst themselves forever. And it comes to light in the first 130 pages of the book. I was already like screeching. I was about to cry. Like my eyes were welling up. And that's the thing about Magnolia Parks. It's, it's a train wreck. It's continuously a train wreck. There's never a moment where it's not, but subjectively it resides in my heart rent free. I just love Magnolia Park so much. And so I am living for the drama. I am very curious to see where we are headed moving forward. I mean, I know I am in for a treat and I am in for a lot of angst because if there's something Jessa Hastings is going to deliver, it's the angst between Magnolia and BJ. So far, this was the best note to start this in. Another day, another 5 a.m. I really am not used to waking up when it's dark anymore. <laughs> I got to page 300 of Magnolia Parks yesterday, so I'm exactly on page 305. And when I tell you guys, I have been losing my mind progressively with Magnolia Parks. I wish I was kidding. It really has solidified the fact that the problem for me was Daisy Hates and not Magnolia. The entire explanation behind the December 3rd event absolutely broke my soul and seeing Magnolia and BJ make progress that feels substantial enough for them to get back together to then see how external forces continue to solidify their worries and their doubts about their relationship and each other. I was talking to a friend yesterday and I literally told her I was like dude if it were to ever take any amount of books for these two to get together it could take just about 10 books for them to get together which is crazy if you think about it. I did order Into the Dark yesterday though because I just know that once I finish The Long Way Home, I'm going to want to have Into the Dark on deck. I don't know that I'm going to read it in April because that's excessive, but at least I'll have it lined up for maybe my May TBR. Also, this thing is loud. I'm sorry, but you know, maybe the ASMR is, is the thing to provide for the aesthetics. Let me just say, Julian Hates is fucking supreme. I really, really love him. And seeing his interactions with Magnolia in The Long Way Home, I know maybe a lot of people didn't like them because of the circumstances surrounding it, but I'm eating it up. I think it's providing peak drama and that is exactly what you want out of Magnolia Parks. Also seeing obviously the whole crew surrounding BJ and Magnolia from Bridget to Henry to Jonah to Tora to everybody else and how they root for them and enable a lot of what's going on in this dynamic whilst also denouncing it at the same time is just about giving the same amount of somersaults and jumping through hoops that Magnolia and BJ do. To me personally, it's wild how as a collective, they all kind of behave the same when it comes to Magnolia and BJ, especially when it comes to their history and their track record and everything that's really messed up that's happened in their relationship or surrounding their relationship and how that doesn't seem to deter anybody from saying you guys should be together. Because Lord knows if it was my friend, oh baby, which I mean is part of the appeal of the book because like I genuinely would never experience this nor would I condone it. And so it's like, so far out of like my playing field and like my personal circumstances that I'm like, hello! 
love. It is fully the way that if this were to happen to like one of my friends or to me, people would be kicking me to the curb, okay? Would be kicking me to Mars and back to knock some sense into me. And yet here is the entire crew going, so when are you guys gonna get together? So are you guys gonna get together? You guys belong together. It's the way I would be smacked, okay? If I ever proclaimed the want, the wish, the desire to come back to somebody that hurts me the way BJ hurts Magnolia and the way that Magnolia hurts BJ, which is still like so wild to see in this book just how much they hurt each other but how they've got these mechanisms in place to apologize without saying anything or to say that they love each other without saying anything so when something major happens whether it's that bj is sleeping with somebody else or magnolia is being mean there is literally these asides in the book of i smiled at him and i love you and he nodded and i'm sorry <laughs> Just like, you guys are crazy. Like the fact that nobody realizes that this is not okay. Like this shouldn't be the norm. This shouldn't be a normal dynamic in any relationship. Not only is it extremely codependent what the both of them have, but it's also extremely toxic and hurtful. Like it's crazy. No wonder they can't have normal relationships outside of each other. And I don't even know that I'd call what they have normal, but no wonder they can't have anything outside of it because they like the crazy and so <laughs> I'm having the best time the book is 527 pages so I've got 222 pages left an angel number 222 I love that do I think we can finish it this morning maybe I wouldn't be opposed also can we talk about growth I don't even have my phone near me literally left it in the bedroom I think that's quite monumental Oh my God, it's bright and early in the morning. Hi. So it's 7.36 and I am a hundred pages away from finishing Magnolia Park's A Long Way Home. And so you best bet, I am going to keep on reading until I finish it. It is fully the way that Magnolia Park's is making me want to read Daisy Hates. Specifically, Daisy Hates The Great Undoing, which is book two. I am so interested in seeing all of the Julian bits that we're not getting in Magnolia Park's. And that's the one thing about Jessa Hastings. Whatever we don't see here or the thing that happen here with Daisy and Julian that seem contextless, we do get the context in the Daisy Hates books. And so even though I DNF'd Daisy Hates one, I sampled the audiobook yesterday because one of my patrons had reassured me that the audiobook is definitely a good one. Sampled it. I think I'm gonna listen to Daisy Hates one. Definitely not gonna do it this month or this week, but I'm thinking of getting the audiobook and then having it on deck so that I can listen to Daisy and just do that. And then when it comes to Daisy Hates the Great Undoing, I'll probably do the same thing and I'll just listen to that audiobook because there's a lot of gang stuff happening on Julian's territory that involves Magnolia in the second book that I am desperate to get context for because there is so much that's happening that we don't get to see because we don't get his POV. I would love to know what exactly is happening, what he's hiding from Magnolia, all of these different crazy things that are kind of alluded to in Magnolia Park's A Long Way Home. And I'm afraid for Magnolia. I'm afraid for Julian. I'm afraid for everybody. And so so there's, there's kind of that. That's my huge takeaway at the moment because of something that just happened in the book. So will The Long Way Home make me finally go back to Daisy Hates and reattempt? I think the answer is yes. Well, now listen here. I finished The Long Way Home and can Jessa Hastings please explain this ending because why am I made out to suffer? I feel like I'm still processing the ending of this book and I did not think it would have so crazy an ending after having a crazy ending in Magnolia Parks 1. This is somehow worse. Lord, I will never know peace with this series, I swear. And I thought we were gonna end up good. I'm giving it five stars, but I definitely wanna sop my eyes out. Oh my God. Why was it so sad? 5.15 a.m. It's a 
new day. And you know what? I do have to admit, today was a little bit of a struggle. I did not want to get up. I only got five hours of sleep. I went to bed at midnight yesterday because we had public sprints. And after I hopped off, I was tidying up, cleaning everything up, organizing, ate a little something, went to bed. And I went to bed a little bit too late. Didn't want to admit this, but today I'm struggling. <laughs> It's now 6 16 a.m so we're technically like an hour after wake up time but we are moving this to the living room because i'm kind of falling asleep on the bed and i've read like 35 pages but so far we're doing kind of good though which is more than i can say about my expectations because i was expecting to not really love this at the beginning so we're moving this we got the emotional support water bottle we've got our book and i am going to fetch something to eat because i woke up hungry today and so we're going to prep a little greek yogurt with some granola some honey and it should do the trick I'd like to report some progress in Throne of the Fallen. I am currently 104 pages into it. So I'm about to start chapter 12. However, a girl is so sleepy. I genuinely should have gone to bed a lot earlier than I did. So before I update you properly on the book, I'm going to catch a shower and wash this hair because I need to wash it. So I'll talk to you in a little bit. It'll be a second for you. One shower later and a hair wash later and we're feeling fresh, which was very much needed. And I am feeling slightly more awake, but it was definitely a mistake to go to bed as late as I did because I am feeling the repercussions of it. I sat down to edit as soon as I was out of the shower, which is why the hair is dry. And I have been snoozing while I've been editing. <laughs> so today I have to make sure that I am going to bed at a reasonable hour because Sundays I do sprints on Patreon. And so I can't can't be sleepy from having woken up four hours before the sprint. So by the time that I walk in there, I'm like falling asleep. We can't be doing that. So tonight is an early bed day. However, I started Throne of the Fallen by Carrie Maniscalco and I'm actually surprisingly really enjoy this, though I didn't expect the book to start out with the mention of a limp dick. I don't know if I want to talk about it, but it was a little strange that <laughs> that kind of popped up in the prologue. It was just a little bit odd. However, I will say the tone of the book immediately clear. You can already tell it's adult. It has a completely different vibe, yet very similar vibes. Obviously, it's a kingdom of the wicked, but my main critique of the overall series is that there's a dissonance in the tones of the book because it ages up from young adult to adult. And while the first book was very plot heavy, it still had the inklings of romance and the tension and whatnot. It was really good. The second book was so much more about the romance and how much smut and spice, I guess, Carrie Maniscalco could sneak in there to kind of solidify and, and, and and validate the relationship between Wrath and Amelia. And it really went downhill for me. And so I was expecting this to be a whole lot better because I already know what I'm getting myself into. And it doesn't feel like, why is there spice when the book clearly doesn't need it? Because we observed book one not having it. And now book two just feel forced. Right off the go, I'm really enjoying this. It's a lot of fun. We follow another Prince of Hell in this one. We follow Envy. And Envy has been losing his powers because apparently what is alluded to in the book is that he fell in love or had some sort of intention entanglement with a human and that for some reason led to the debilitation of his powers and now he has been invited by the Fae to participate in a game and said game really is his best opportunity to regain his powers to solidify the position of his court and really make sure that his circle of hell his court his people are okay are healthy and that they're not suffering because of a bad decision that he made and he figures out quite quickly into the game that he cannot play on his own. In fact, very quick into it, he needs to commission an art piece from Camila Antonius, who is our female protagonist, and she immediately says no to the commissioned piece because the piece that she has to make is something that she was always told to never do. And so right from the go, there's a lot of tension in that he has a very specific thing he needs to get done. He can't do it without her. She wants nothing to do with it. She also doesn't know yet that he's a prince of hell. She just thinks that he's a lord because that's what he's masking as. And so as the book starts, 
starts, we see Envy playing the game and then Camila dealing with one of her go-to customers that is in some shady business. He is very much into forgeries and kind of low-key crime. And there are other art vendors and artists that he works with, but it seems like there's an underlying tone in there of there's more to it than meets the eye. So I do think he may be the antagonist of the story or somewhat of an antagonist if even just for Camila. And so immediately the sultriness and the tension and the attraction between Camila and Envy is very much in the story. This is much more a fantasy romance than the first series was. And so you can immediately tell she is very into him. She's like fantasizing about all the things he could do to her. And he's already like, she's mine until the end of the game. And so I can't wait to see how everything progresses. I am really enjoying it so far. I don't want to speak like too soon because I'm only 104 pages in and the book is like over 500 pages. But I am really hoping that I end up loving this so that this can more than make up for my lack of enjoyment for the Kingdom of the Wicked series. I'm not gonna lie, today was a bit painful. Waking up at 5 a.m. on a Sunday when I don't need to is a different beast. I'm having such difficulty to wake up. I don't know if it's because I slept eight hours or if it's because I'm tired or if it's because it's a Sunday. Somebody explain that logic to me because I feel like I shouldn't be having as much difficulty, but it's 5.13 a.m. So we're going to sit down and read in my little corner. Clearly we're cozied up with our little blanket and that's not going to change because I am fully ready to kick back, relax and read. I love that the cats are also scratching the armchair. Every time I'm here, they just scratch it. They're like, it doesn't smell like me anymore. And so they just start scratching the freaking armchair. And it's the way I've got every light on in my bedroom because otherwise I feel that I may just fall asleep. Let's let's start reading. I guess this is my proper good morning. Hello, everybody. So I have been reading for the past three and a half hours. It's 8.38 a.m. I look so disheveled right now. Hi, but I need to go shower. And before I do so, I wanted to give you an update. I am pleasantly surprised to announce that even though there is loads of chemistry between Camila and Envy, and they obviously want to give in to their respective urges, it doesn't overtake the plot. The plot comes first. And it's because Envy needs to save his court from damnation, Basically, people are continuously forgetting who they are, who the fellow people in the court of Envy are. They even forget who Prince Envy is. And so it is a very dire situation. And again, it's just getting more and more tense for him. And the stakes really are very high for him specifically. And I think specifically, it's so cool to see his journey in this game because nobody else is aware of what is happening in House Envy. Everybody is completely oblivious to the facts that his court is not functioning the same way that it used to. And so it is a burden that he himself on his own is carrying. And so I think on that side, the competition is fantastic. To see slowly but surely the mystery of who Camila is unveil is so good. And I love that Carrie Maniscalco is pacing it so nicely that it's not revealing information too fast. Like the intrigue of what and who she is and who her parents were is paced so well that I am in constant wonderment, I guess, of her ability and what she will continue to do and how and when we'll find out what exactly it is that she's able to fully do and what she is. We have finally gone into hell, which is fantastic. So I'm sure the story will get juicier and juicier as we go along, both in plot and maybe between our main characters, which I would not be mad about. I love that Camila is so determined and she is so, so resilient and so headstrong. The premise of the Princess of Hell is kind of riddled by temptation she is not tempted very easily and she holds in her confidence and she holds in her restraint so nicely. And so I love seeing that because not only has it taken every prince of hell that she has met so far by surprise, but also completely taken Envy by storm. And then Envy himself too. I love when he was disguising as a lord. I thought that was absolutely wonderful. And now that we're diving deeper into seeing him as who he really 
ideas and not just masking as something or someone else. It is every bit as incredible as I'd like it to be, just the tension between the siblings and his powers and his duty and the way that he interacts with Camila, just everything about this book is fantastic. So I've got sprints with my patrons in literally 17 minutes. So I will likely keep reading this then because I don't think I'd be able to stop. So I'll keep reading. I'll update you when I've got any updates to give, whether that's today or tomorrow morning as well. And we'll go from there. Guess who has an update for you at nearly 10 p.m. at night? I really should not be coming in with an update at this time because I should technically be in bed given the fact that I'm going to wake up at 5 a.m. tomorrow. And I think you can tell by my tiny eyes right now that I definitely want to be in bed. But let me give you an update. I finished Throne of the Fallen. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, my plan was not to finish this today because I was telling myself, Mel, pace yourself, pace yourself. I was fully planning on waking up tomorrow, finishing it then because I did read some more of it during sprints today. And then that just kept on wanting to make me read more and more and more and more. I went out with my family for lunch. I came back home and then I read some more and then I finished Throne of the Fallen. I don't know exactly what rating I'm going to give it. I'm really torn right now between a four and a five, but I think a four and a half star kind of sounds nice, but I do want to give you this update before going to bed because we're choosing a new book to start tomorrow morning. I can't believe that I'm basically running through a book every two days, which is kind of revolutionary at the moment. I really do feel like I am experiencing some sort of awakening given the fact that I do not only have so much time to read now, it seems like, but that I'm actually reading consistently. I don't find it difficult to focus on books. I'm not finding it difficult to pick anything up. I'm not finding it difficult to hyper-focus on books and not get distracted with something else. So I feel like it's quite revolutionary. I'm not going to lie. And I am enjoying every single second of it, except maybe the fact that it's been like a hard switch between waking up at, you know, 7, 7.30 typically to waking up at 5 a.m. And my bedtime is the thing that is not fully corrected yet. Kerry Maniscalco, you have redeemed yourself. I think this was an adult debut. Well done. It was sultry. It was sexy. It was tense, chemistry filled every single page. The plot plotted, the characters charactered, <laughs> and everything that needed to happen in the book really did happen. I loved finding out more about court politics in this one and finding out the difference between, you know, the Fey realm and then the demon seven circle of hell realm, and even finding out the differences between every single circle, what differentiates every single demon brother, what exactly differentiates each of their court, what exactly differentiates who they are as a ruler versus the other sibling. And so I think as far as the world building goes, it was really, really rich with it, which I definitely appreciate. It definitely stands on its own without even having to read Kingdom of the Wicked, which I was also kind of surprised to see and very pleasantly surprised to see. So if you've been thinking you want to go into this one, but you want to read Kingdom of the Wicked first, it's really not necessary. Like you'd obviously get the context of Wrath and Amelia, but other than that, I feel like you'd be kind of okay stepping into this one without having read those other ones first. I also really loved that Camila as our female protagonist is very unlike a lot of the other main characters that I have read about. She is very yes stubborn and, and she's very strong headed and she is very witty and she, you know, she knows what she wants. She's willing to go get it. She's very resilient. She's a fighter, but maybe not so in the way that we are used to seeing maybe a lot of protagonists in fantasy books. I feel like I'm very used to seeing the protagonists that are very in their masculine energy that that, you know, will grab a sword and, and off you till they can't no more, that gear up for battle and they lead like these big ass armies and who are ready to upend the entire system because they themselves are enough to like make some sort of change. And I think I'm so used to seeing that type of strength in the female main characters that seeing somebody like Camila who leans so much more into like her, I guess we'll call it like her divine feminine into a lot of her feminine energy was really, really nice and seeing a main character that is not really bothered by like swords and daggers and like being incredibly vicious in the way that she fights, I think was very refreshing, particularly in a fantasy romance setting because particularly in this genre, I think I'm so used to seeing these characters that are so willing to be extremely cutthroat, not only with the love interest, but everybody else around them. And so although she does have her guards up, although she does have secrets, although there is kind of like this huge cloud of questions hanging up in the air, just kind of surrounding 
surrounding her. She is very different to a lot of the other ones I've read. It kind of reminds me of the main character in An Enchantment of Ravens by Margaret Rogerson because our main character, Camila, is a painter. She very much loves her craft. She loves bringing, you know, her visions to life. And so as somebody who is a painter, is an artist, I think the lens through which she sees the world is, is so rich and reinvigorating and fresh and beautiful. She's kind of sees the beauty and the appeal to everything, even like the most darkest of things, which I think is why her and the Prince of Hell Envy work so well together is because she doesn't shy away from all of those like crueler, darker tones, not only to his court, but to his world in general and who he is. Really, really loved seeing a main character that was much more concerned, I guess, with outsmarting everybody with her wits rather than a weapon. Because listen, wits can be a weapon in and of itself. And so I really, really loved that aspect. The fact that she, again, is kind of different to what I typically read, specifically in this genre at least. And so it was very refreshing. I really, really loved it. I think the one thing that I didn't particularly love was the ending. I typically don't like endings that are kind of wrapped in the perfect red bow, like happy birthday to you. I really don't love those types of endings and I find that it ended up a little bit too nice just given the chaos that was ensuing at the end and like the shift from one thing to the other. Aside from that, I really don't have any other complaints because the rest of the book really was a fantastic time. So had fun with it. That's the final update for Throne of the Fallen and we'll choose tomorrow what we start because I've got no idea. I'm like, do I really want to go for romancing Mr. Bridgerton? Do I want to go for something in my TBR? At the moment, I don't know. Going to be so very candid with you. Don't know where my glasses are. I literally took them off three seconds ago and I don't know where I've placed them. So I guess we're here with Mel with no glasses. I am coming in with an update at what time is it? 10 06 p.m. I definitely need to be in bed by now. But listen, I just finished filming a video, which is why I'm still awake at this time. I was not expecting to film so late today. However, I spent all of today extremely drowsy. I struggled so hard today to wake up. I even consider, and I have to be quite candid and honest here, I genuinely thought about putting off the alarm, going back to bed, and just not doing it today, <laughs> and waking up at whatever time I wanted. But I evidently had b-roll of me falling asleep on my couch, and then Sil climbed up to my chest, and she took a nap, and she acted like a weighted blanket, and I didn't wake up until 9 a.m. I did read a little bit of Good Girl, Bad Blood, which is the book I started out this morning. You can tell that I was asleep by the fact that I didn't even talk, and I didn't even say, oh my god, hi, it's good morning, I woke up, nothing. Started this book this morning, I got to page 31, so I'm about to start chapter three. And I wasn't expecting this book to start out that way. I thought we were going to immediately start out with a new case that our main character Pip was going to solve. However, it starts out as a direct continuation of A Good Girl's Guide to Murder, the first book, as now Pip has got a podcast called a good girl's guide to murder. And as she discusses everything that went down during the Andy Bell case that is established in the first book and establishing her own line of investigation, the things that she found, how she went about her whole investigative process. And also now that the trial is taking place for the Andy Bell case, her and Ravi are really into the court scene, particularly Ravi is the one visiting. And so he is kind of reporting back on everything he is seeing kind of behind the scenes and inside the courtroom so that the people are actively live in the know of how the case is going. I do know that this book establishes a new mystery to solve. I think it's a new murder. And so hasn't happened yet. So the start was a little bit surprising. I'm not disliking it. I just think that I was very, very sleepy this morning and I was not really engaging with the text. Like I still understood everything I read, but I think I was like too sleepy to keep on going with it. And so I'm going to keep on reading tomorrow morning, obviously when we do wake up at 5 a.m. I again, we're nearing the end. I only have two days left. Tomorrow's Tuesday and we've got Wednesday and that's it. And so maybe we can finish this book by Wednesday. If I wake up tomorrow worse off than I woke up today, that's gonna be a problem because I don't know how much reading is gonna get done. I'll talk to you then.
I've been getting some reading done. It is also for context, 7.15 a.m. Hello. I don't think you guys even saw that. 7.15 a.m. There we go. My eyes feel so strange right now because I took my makeup off so late and my face is like super sensitive, never mind my eyes. And so I literally took off my makeup and I feel like my eyes are still so sensitive from like scrubbing them to get everything off. And I feel like my eyes are tiny at the moment. So don't let it fool you. It's not that I'm necessarily too tired, more than my eyes are just really sensitive. And speaking of sensitive eyes, I did cry in the first hundred pages, good girl, bad blood. I've been calling this a good girl's guide to murder. That's not entirely incorrect, but I have to remind myself that it's the second book. It's got a different title, but I got to page literally exactly 100. So I'm about to start chapter 10 and it definitely yesterday wasn't the book. It was me. It was me being tired. I am having no difficulty at all going through this today. I do have to stop reading though because I have to jump into some editing because I want to be done fairly early with that, but I am really enjoying this. The main mystery of the book has already kicked in. So literally one of Pip's friends, Connor's brother, Jamie, goes missing the night of of Sal's memorial and they don't know exactly why the police is not helping either because they know that he has got kind of like a history of running away from home and being a little bit of a rebel, a dropout, and not necessarily having the best track record when it comes to not only his relation with his family but the way that he carries himself on a daily basis. So the police immediately brands it a low-risk case but his family doesn't seem to think that that is the case. So they go to Pip naturally since she solved Andy Bell's case and basically go to her pleading to help them to carry out some sort of investigation if the police won't, to cover it in her podcast, bring a lot of attention to it so that the media kind of catches on to what is happening to see if anybody has got any tips, if anybody has seen Jamie, if anybody has got any sort of information on what could have potentially happened to him. Aside from him going missing at the memorial, he is also friends with Nat Da Silva, which is one of the characters that we observe in A Good Girl's Guide to Murder that is also very involved in the Andy Bell case and he used to be friends. I can't remember if it was with Andy or with Sal but he was definitely friends with the people involved in the case in book one. I don't know if his disappearance is something to do with that or if it's something entirely different. We'll find out in due time but there definitely seems to be kind of shifting odd behavior. He was very changing when it came to his moods before he disappeared, became very mysterious, started sneaking out. So there were definitely like behavioral patterns that started changing before he fully disappeared. And so it does bring up the question of, is it just about him being rebellious and running away from home, potentially, you know, meeting up with like a friend or a girlfriend or something that caught his attention? Or is it really something other? And is he just disappeared or is he dead? Is he alive? And so, so far it's been a good time. Just like the first book, this one also has some mixed media elements. So you do get podcast entries. Let me see if I can find the one that I was reading before the update. But yeah, you have got like podcast entries. This one's of Pip on her own, but she's definitely got a few with interviews with other people like this one, which happened with Connor. Another one that happened with Jamie's mom. We also have pictures in the book as evidence. It kind of reminds me of like the Hunt a Killer games, which I think is quite fun. So you also have got pictures with evidence and clues that may all lead to finding out what happened to Jamie. And so I think the mixed media aspect to it all is quite fun always. And so, so far I'm having a good time. I can't wait to keep on reading, see where it goes. I've heard a lot of people say that this second book is far and miles better than the first one. And the first one was already a huge hit. I really, really enjoyed it upon rereading it. And so if this one is said to be better, I can't wait to see exactly why. And so we'll see what happens with this one. I'll keep you guys updated if I do read anything else today. I doubt that I will just because there is loads of work to be done editing and planning wise and importing footage and sorting through things that I don't know if I'll get a chance to read again today. Maybe tonight, but it's kind of, you know, we'll see if it if I do or if I don't. And we are right back to where it all started, the bedroom. It is 5.30 a.m. And you may be wondering, Mel, oh my God, why didn't you update at five? sharp. Girl, bathroom breaks exist when you wake up, okay? I'm going to sit down, read some more of Good Girl, Bad Blood, and then we'll close this out. I can't believe it's been a week.
welcome to the last update of the video. I just hopped out of the shower, washed the hair because it was absolutely necessary. And it is currently, please hold, 10.45 a.m. So we are done. This is the last update before we close this out. And not gonna lie, today woke up good. The only thing that I experienced was just a little bit of fatigue, but I think it's probably a combination of having finished two books already in this video. I read those quite fast and then waking up early without going to bed at the right time. And so I feel like a combo of both of those things was kind of making me a little bit sluggish this morning, but I still read 42 pages, I think. Was it 42 pages? Yes, 42 pages of Good Girl, Bad Blood. I'm about to start chapter 15. And I do have to say, I don't know that I'm loving this more than I loved A Good Girl's Guide to Murder. Like it's good. And it's good in the sense that the author clearly has some sort of formula figured out for the thriller vibes, the mystery vibes. But outside of that, I don't know that this is doing anything so extraordinary as to compete with the first book, which was already so good. And so I'm enjoying it, but it's not, you know, I don't know that it's better. So we'll see the more that I get into it, if it, you know, maybe the plot twist is really crazy, the way it presents some information is even crazier. But so far, it's just been kind of pretty standard with what we saw in book one. And so at the point where I'm at, there is officially an investigation going by Miss Pip herself. She is interviewing people and recording things for the podcast and gathering information and blueprints and maps and just all of the things to kind of map out Jamie's last steps and where he was seen last. But as all things go, the last time or place that people thought they saw him was not the last time he was sighted. And that is something that Pip is discovering. The more she goes along with the book is that a lot more people either saw him or interacted with him before he fully disappeared. And so it's a matter of figuring out why he was experiencing a lot of those mood swings that he was experiencing right before he kind of poofed. And not only that, but also who was the person he was talking to on the phone, which had a very seemingly aggressive conversation and exactly what was inciting that. And so that's kind of all of the elements that are showing up right now in the book of not everything is what meets the eye. So let's figure the case out. And so again, enjoyable, but nothing extraordinary at the moment. So we'll see how this ends up being. Today was our last morning. Like low key, I was thinking about it yesterday. I do think I'm gonna still wake up every day at 5 a.m. and at least attempt to make this a somewhat part of my routine, though I will have to force myself to go to bed earlier. And I feel like that's also a fantastic thing because it'll force me again to figure out a better sleep schedule for myself. Because if there's anything I've encountered this week, as far as the truth, is that I really don't struggle with waking up. My struggle is going to bed and not going to bed in the sense of insomnia or I can't sleep. It's just in the sense of let's get our asses to bed, bitch. Turn off the work, turn off whatever it is you're doing. Don't get distracted and manage your nighttime well. And so we'll see how all things go. I'll keep you updated on this 5 a.m. journey if I do manage to make this a consistent part of my routine and how it goes long term. I think that could be like a fun thing to update you guys on as time goes by. But I'd say it was really, really successful. We read two full books and Actually, let's tally up the pages because I am not sure how many pages we read in the past week. So I know The Long Way Home was 527 pages and then 142 pages of Good Girl, Bad Blood. And then for Throne of the Fallen, I also don't know how long this book was. Do you know it was over 500 pages, nearing 600? We do know that much, but let's see. This is the bonus chapter. Then we have got the acknowledgments. 561. Not so bad. So by waking up at 5 a.m. and mostly doing all of my reading in the morning, say for maybe the days that I did have sprints and I did take advantage of those sprints and I read some more throughout the day, I read a total of 1,230 pages, which I will say is a success. We had one five-star book. We had another 4.5 book, which is nearing a five-star. So it's really, really good anyways. And we are well on our way to the halfway point of a third book. So I'd say if there is any success to be had, that is probably it. I think that is phenomenal. So there's that. That's it for today. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you did, don't forget to give it a massive thumbs up down below. Comment down below. Are you an early riser? Do you prefer to read at night? Do you have a reading routine kind of set for yourself? Do you read any chance you get? Do you wake up earlier in the morning to do so? Do you read mostly on your commutes to work? I'd love to know what your reading routine looks like because this, I think, has been the first 
solid step that I have made towards actually making a sustainable reading routine for myself. Because before I was just kind of reading whenever, but this is like a for sure foolproof way to make sure that I kind of read every day. Again, and carve those pockets of peace out for myself, which I think is fantastic. Let a girl know also if you've read any of the books I mentioned in this video, what are you currently reading? And if you reach the end of the video, let us leave a key emoji down in the comments for Throne of the Fallen or a boat emoji as well for Magnolia Park's The Long Way Home. I think either of those could be fun. You pick and choose. You can leave both if you want to, if you're feeling frisky and make sure you subscribe for more content like this. I do have a Patreon. It's always linked at the top of the description in case you guys want to support the channel further. It's huge help towards keeping this as a sustainable thing and to kind of improve things over time and to keep things afloat. And so Patreon is always linked down below in case you want to get some early access for videos and pitch in for videos and get book clubs and a Discord server and movie nights and game nights and loads of sprints and everything and anything that you can potentially imagine that you won't see anywhere else. Patreon is the place to be. So that is always linked down below in case you guys want to join the Citadel. I love you guys so, so much and I shall see you on the next one. Bye!